Hello, I'm John Foster, and I'm a medical doctor who does Social Security disability exams. And today I'm going to talk about a subject that fascinates me, the psychology of functional illness. As usual, everything I say reflects my own views based on my own experience and learning and does not reflect the views of the Social Security Administration or any other medical body. So first, I'd like to give you my definition of functional illness. Functional illness is an illness that the patient complains of but does not actually have, or an illness that the patient actually has but that they complain of in a greatly exaggerated fashion. The patient may be consciously aware that they don't have the illness they complain of, or they may be unconscious of the fact that they don't have the illness that they complain of. Next, I'd like to give a little bit of my philosophy of psychology, which differs quite a bit from current American psychiatry. I have some serious criticisms of the state of psychiatry in the U.S. today. I hope if you're a psychiatrist, you won't be offended, but will take this as constructive criticism. I think it's essential that you know about the big five personality traits. These are extraversion, conscientiousness, agreeableness, neuroticism, and openness. If you're not familiar with these traits, I've put a link in the description below to an excellent lecture by Dr. Jordan Peterson on the big five personality traits. It's important to understand that all of these traits exist on a spectrum and that they are all adaptive in certain circumstances. Let me give openness as an example. Openness includes creativity and the willingness to try on new things and experiences. Someone who's high in openness would be suitable for an artist where they want to try out new techniques, new painting methods, new forms of music. However, someone who's an accountant who does your income tax returns would be better off being low in openness. You don't want your accountant doing your taxes creatively. You want them to stick rigidly to the rules and laws. Next, I want to give my impressions of mental illness, which are somewhat antiquated, just as I am. I feel, however, that this is better than the current DSM-5, which I fear was created largely based on financial incentives rather than any medical or patient-centered incentives. I divide mental illness into neuroses, psychoses, personality disorders, addictions, and organic brain disease. To be classified as a mental illness, a condition has to meet three criteria. Number one, it has to be extreme. For example, feeling a little bit down from time to time is normal. Feeling extremely depressed to the point where you can't even get out of bed is an illness. Second of all, the condition has to be persistent, has to last weeks, months, or even years. And third, it has to be maladaptive. It does not help the patient get on with their life. Now on to the types. Psychotic is fairly easy to understand. The patient is somewhat, although rarely completely, out of touch with reality. Schizophrenia is the classic example. The patient has hallucinations, false perceptions, and the patient has delusions, false beliefs. Note, however, that even the most psychotic patient is rarely completely out of touch with reality. For example, most patients who are actively schizophrenic still understand that the earth is down and the sky is up. Next are the neuroses. In the neuroses, the patient is in touch with reality and tends to be extremely sensitive to negative emotion, 
negative emotions being anxiety, depression, and anger. Importantly, the neurotic patient suffers while those around the neurotic patient do not suffer. Third, personality disorders are maladaptive ways of dealing with other humans. In the personality disorders, others suffer, the patient may suffer, but usually others suffer at least as much, if not more than the patient. Addictions are pretty self-explanatory. These include alcoholism, addiction to other drugs, and addiction to behaviors such as gambling. Finally, the organic brain disorders are actual physical diseases of the brain that cause the patient to act in maladaptive fashions. An example would be Alzheimer's disease, where the patient gets lost in what used to be familiar surroundings or does not recognize what used to be familiar faces. Psychosis, addiction, and organic brain diseases are readily recognized by even non-psychiatrist physicians. The area of confusion tends to be between the neuroses and the personality disorders. And here's a useful tip I read some time ago. If within five minutes of beginning an interview with the patient, you want to run out the door screaming, they have a personality disorder. You may feel bad for a patient with neurosis. And if you're the sympathetic sort, a patient with neurosis may cause you to share some of their negative feelings, such as depression and anxiety, but you won't get that strong negative reaction you get with someone with a personality disorder. So what are the psychological types I see with patients with functional illness? Well, I'm going to dispense with the rarest first, which is the psychotic patient, the patient who has delusions or hallucinations that they're ill. I've seen this once in a while, but it's quite rare in Social Security disability exams. My most notable case was a young patient who came to me with a chief complaint that they couldn't breathe through their nose. I was surprised to examine their nose and find everything was normal and they could breathe perfectly well. When I got a bit deeper into the patient's history, I found that the patient believed that they had actually completely stopped breathing about three months before they saw me. They were suffering from a first episode of psychosis and had Cotard's delusion, a delusion that they were dead or decaying. A more common type is the hypochondriac. A hypochondriac is a person who's high in neuroticism and they have a fixed delusion that they're ill while the rest of their sensorium is clear. They don't have hallucinations and they don't have any other delusions. Generally, for whatever reason, they're unable to express their inner mental suffering and it comes out instead as corporeal or physical suffering. They tend to have a lot of pain that does not correlate with any physical disease. Often, hypochondriacs are extremely agreeable, and extreme agreeableness can be a real problem. You might think that agreeableness is a good trait, but overly agreeable people tend to be attracted to, attractive to predators. A predator could be anything from an overly aggressive salesperson that the overly agreeable person is unable to say no to, to a purse snatcher or robber. Or it could be a manipulative boss who repeatedly asks the overly agreeable person to work extra hours for no extra pay. So what's the person who can't bring themselves to say no to do? Well, sometimes they develop an illness. It's much easier to say I can't work extra this week because I'm sick than I can't work extra this week because you're taking advantage of me. And if you don't give me extra pay, I'm going to look for another job.
Finally, there are the personality disorders, and there are two types of personality disorders I see with functional illness. Number one is narcissistic personality disorder, and number two is psychopathic personality disorder, which our lame psychiatrists have renamed antisocial personality disorder which I think has been a big mistake. Now, narcissism is a big feature of both narcissistic personality disorder and psychopathic personality disorder. The major differentiating feature is that narcissistic personality disorder folks are high in neuroticism. They're sensitive to anxiety and depression. Psychopathic personality disorder folks, on the other hand, are extremely low in neuroticism. They don't get depressed and they don't get anxious, even in situations that would make normal people extremely anxious. For example, I was reading a piece by a psychologist who studies folks with psychopathic personality disorder. She was interviewing a psychopath who is describing fleeing with his gang from the police in a car while they were shooting it out with the police. And they were describing it as if it was the most marvelous experience on earth. I'm sure most of the people watching this video would consider fleeing from the police while having a shootout an extremely unpleasant and anxiety provoking experience. Narcissistic folks feel that they're special and because they're special, the normal rules don't apply to them, and everyone else should serve them. They tend to be quite Machiavellian or manipulative. They will manipulate others to get whatever they want, and don't tend to feel bad for the people they manipulate. When it comes to disability, they often feel that they're entitled to disability payments regardless of their medical condition, and that everything should be handed to them on a silver platter. I remember one very narcissistic patient who told me he didn't know why Social Security was requiring to have a, him to have a disability exam. That was fine for other folks, but they should have just taken his word for it that he was disabled. Narcissistic people tend to react badly to a disability exam and to the physician performing the exam because they recognize that their word is and their entitlement is being questioned. They're re being required to follow the rules that everyone else follows. They're not getting special consideration and they can be extremely unpleasant to deal with in a disability exam. Psychopathic patients tend to be different. They do feel entitled and don't feel the rules apply to them. But because they're not sensitive to negative emotion, they tend to be more easygoing. Psychopathic folks are the type we call malingerers. They're consciously aware that they're not ill or injured and set out to fool the physician and the Social Security Administration and others by convincing them that they are seriously ill or injured. They feel superior. They feel that everyone else is a fool or a chump that they can manipulate and take advantage of, including you, the doctor doing their disability exam, and the Social Security Administration, who they feel they can fool as well. They enjoy lying and fooling others. This is called duping delight. They'll lie even when there's no advantage to be gained by lying. The reason why they do this is this reinforces their feelings of superiority. They have little empathy for the feelings of others, but unlike folks with narcissistic personality disorder, because they're not so sensitive to negative emotion, they can often control their outward emotions very well. They'll often appear overly polite. Another feature I've noticed with people on the far side of the psychopathic spectrum is that they'll often dress in a very flashy, yet somewhat cheap 
manner, the way they dress is designed to manipulate others, not to reflect their own taste or values. For example, this would be the sort of person who would wear a fake Rolex watch. Because psychopathic folks are superficially charming and polite, they're really not that difficult to deal with in a disability exam. Just don't get taken in by their charm and allow them to dupe and manipulate you. I'm going to end with another thing I learned from Dr. Jordan Peterson, which is, if you tell a lie long enough and often enough, you will become unable to determine the difference between your lie and the truth. And I think that often happens in folks with functional ill. Well, I hope you found this interesting and helpful. And as always, remember, if it happens, it's possible.